Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the And God Said podcast. I'm your host, Reverend Kimberly Constant, and this podcast is offered in conjunction with my online Bible, can't talk, online Bible study called Cover to Cover. You can find more information on my website, KimberlyConstantMinistries.com. And I'm welcoming you here. So happy to have you here, whether you are part of that Bible study or someone who's just been following along via the podcast on YouTube or someone new to uh, our community because of this specific topic on ethics and the New Testament. I encourage you, if you haven't, to stop and listen to the first lecture in this series of episodes that lays down the foundation for what it means to be a disciple and kind of the cultivation of spiritual fruit and some of our rules for discussion as we move forward into more specifics. For this episode, we're going to talk about our model for discernment. How are we going to go about sort of wrestling with each of these issues? Uh, It's nice to have a model to follow so that we don't just dive in with thoughts and feelings Uh, Although those are important, (laughs) we want to kind of have some basis of biblical foundation to begin these discussions. So we're going to dive in. I've entitled this episode Model for Discernment. So as we wrestle with ethical dilemmas as Christian believers, as followers of Jesus Christ, uh, there's some things we should be doing. We should engage in critical and reflective conversation Uh, We struggle with this, don't we? I think it's really hard, especially in our current society, to talk about some of these issues because so often just asking questions or expressing a viewpoint will have you labeled as hateful or intolerant or ignorant or some other um, terrible name. Uh, We are not encouraging conversation as much these days in society, but that's to our detriment. We need to be having these conversations. We can't learn unless we're able to come to the table, bringing all of the good and the bad and the ugly with us. Uh, We can engage respectfully and we will and we should, but we also can be honest about our thoughts and feelings. And that's the way that we can encourage change and growth. So we need to be Um, critical in this conversation and that again as I said at the opening of this episode we're not just going to rely on thoughts and feelings but we're going to try to bring in some evidence whatever we can find for us as having this conversation as believers and in the context of a bible study what evidence can we bring in from scripture and then also from our ability to reason uh, from church tradition, good or bad in some cases, and as well our experience, um, kind of our spiritual experiences. And number two, we need to submit to the authority of scripture and stand together on its foundation. Scripture is the lifeline. It's the guidebook. It is the revelation of God for us to enable us to have these discussions and make these decisions. Uh, It is everything for a follower of Jesus Christ. And a correct understanding of scripture is fundamental, first of all, to begin this discussion. So if you're new here and this is your first interaction with our community, again, so happy to have you here. But just know that some of the things we're going to talk about, we've been studying the Bible. We are almost done. We have one week left, Revelation. So we've got a lot of context here. And I encourage you, we would love to have you join us for the next round of Bible study so that you too could have a uh, better background in order to have these types of discussions. But for believers in Jesus Christ, we submit to the authority of Scripture and we recognize that it is foundational. But here's the rub. (laughs) We have to interpret. And our interpretations, being that they're coming from dusty, imperfect human beings, can be flawed. We can get it wrong. We can't. There are incorrect interpretations of scripture. There are a, a range of correct interpretations in some cases. It's not an easy discipline. Uh, This is why Bible studies exist because, and you will never get tired of it. You will never run out of things to study because it's, it's difficult. We're studying things that were written thousands of years ago in a language, in languages that are now considered dead. Uh, Biblical Hebrew and biblical Greek, Greek are not spoken any longer. The modern day Hebrew and Greek are different than what's in the Bible. 
Uh, we have context that's missing, especially in the New Testament, where these are a lot of the books are letters. So we don't have the context that began the letter in the first place. So there's a lot of holes in communication that we have to fill in in order to do our interpretive work. It is very possible we have the Holy Spirit to guide us. We have a lot of scholarship and uh, discussions over the last 2,000 years of the church that really can help us. But we always need to remember that uh, any interpretation does have the possibility of not being completely correct. We get it wrong often. Scripture itself is not wrong, but the way in which we can interpret Scripture absolutely can be wrong. Uh, so we need to have a lot of humility. And then we need to try to determine the will of God for our community of faith. Uh, the bigger and broader we get in terms of trying to discern an ethical course of action for like the entire world is going to be a lot more difficult than trying to determine an ethical course of action for the 20 people with whom we do life on a daily basis. Uh, that's not to say that we don't try sometimes to come up with some constants, some some areas in, in which we can have, you know, a similar understanding and way of life. And certainly that exists. But in some cases, things are going to be very specific to certain communities of faith. Um, one such example for this, I talked about it in the last episode, is that concept of, you know, in Christ we're free. We can do so much. Uh, but we have to be careful that in that 20 or so people group with whom we do life, we want to make sure we're not doing something that hampers a brother or sister's faith. So um, the example they use in the New Testament is eating idol meats. In that day, eating meat sacrificed to idol, there was nothing that prohibited it. Uh, if you knew that that idol wasn't a real thing, go ahead and eat the meat. But for some people who had been pagans and were new to the Christian faith, it was a struggle. If they ate that idol meat, it might cause them to backslide and to go back to their old ways of faith. And so the Apostle Paul, for instance, in one of his letters says, um, don't eat the meat if it's hurting your brother or sister. And Paul says, goes as far as to say, I'll never eat meat again if it means that a brother and sis or sister in faith can walk a little stronger. So that's what I mean for discerning some things in our community of faith. Uh, some things, you know, we need a broader lens and some we need to narrow the lens. At the same time, we also have to recognize that we as followers of Jesus cannot expect the rest of society to conform to our way of life. We are holding ourselves to a certain set of morals and ethical standards based on the Bible. Not every other person is going to agree with that. We cannot coerce moral consensus for people who do not believe in Jesus, who don't follow Jesus, and who don't uh, submit to the Bible as an authority in their life. Many of our convictions are going to only make sense in light of our faith and in light of the authority of the Bible. So we have to be careful there. And the New Testament writers talk about this a lot, where, you know, within our community, we hold each other accountable. But when we're talking to someone that who is not yet a follower of Jesus Christ, we're not going to judge them or hold them accountable for the way of life that they're living because it doesn't align with ours. That's to be expected for people who aren't part of the followers of Jesus. Some difficulties that we're going to confront as we work through these issues. Um, biblical interpretations. As I said, there are diverse interpretations. So there's definitely wrong ways to read scripture, but there's a multitude often of correct interpretations. There's also, there's also different types and ways to interpret the Bible. So we have a very diverse reading of the biblical text that's possible. All you need to do is look at biblical scholarship to know that that is true. Uh, so the questions then are, how do we discern a way forward? Which interpretations are best? We want to look at what we can rule out as completely wrong and then what do we do when we genuinely, humbly disagree in our interpretations? Is that okay? Where is that okay? And how do we handle that? Um, the next difficulty that we've kind of already been thinking about is society. As I said, society's definition and pursuit of ethics is going to conflict with the Christian worldview. 
it is. It's to be expected. So how do we, as followers of Jesus, both practice integrity and adhere to our faith, but also live in the world? We're supposed to be the hands and feet and voices of Jesus, offering love and grace and light to this world. And so to do that, we can't uh, wall ourselves off and only interact with fellow believers. We've got to get out there into the world. So how do we live according to our own ethical and moral convictions that we have from the Bible and yet minister to a world who doesn't agree with us? And then finally, we have to confront a lack of humility and love, both inside the church and outside. Humility and love have to underscore our ethical discussions and our decisions. Without these, any conclusion, even if it's correct, is going to be meaningless. Everything has to have a layer of humility and love over it and undergirding it. Uh, they say this often in the Bible. Jesus talks about it. The New Testament writers talks about it. Paul talks about it in the context of spiritual gifts. Like, it doesn't matter if you are the most elegant teacher of scripture that ever existed. If you don't have love, it's worthless. And that's true of our ethical way of life, too. It has to be coming from a place of love and humility. So now let's think about putting a biblical framework around this discussion. So the one that I'm going to propose, and I get almost all of this material from a book called The Moral Vision of the New Testament. It's by Richard B. Hayes. It's super scholarly. I read it in seminary. It's not the easiest thing to read, but if I hopefully can do a good job of distilling it down to its uh, his, you know, prime information, it does provide sort of a helpful way to begin to have this discussion of ethics. So in, with that in mind, we want to read the Bible carefully. We want to seek unifying themes in scripture, if we can find them. We want to do our best to relate the Bible to our situation. This means we're going to have to engage in making metaphors because a lot of our issues just don't come up in the Bible. And then finally, we need to live out the Bible text. Um, Hayes wrote, no true understanding exists apart from lived uh, obedience. We live out scripture in the life of our Christian community and in the life of going out into the world and being the hands and feet of Jesus Christ. Uh, as I said in the last episode, the first episode in this uh, ethical series, um, you know, nothing can be done apart from community. Discipleship is enacted in community. And that makes it messy, but let's think it also makes it fun, right? That's the good challenge. We've got to figure out how to do this together. So first I want to talk about something that is often called the Wesleyan quadrilateral. This is the intersection of scripture, tradition, reason and experience. And it's a little more updated model from that original quadrilateral. Uh, but the idea is that these four aspects of life inform our life in Christ. But we want to think of it almost as a three-legged stool. So the seat of the stool is scripture. And scripture is supported by the legs of tradition, reason, and experience. Scripture is first and foremost. And then we look at things like church tradition. What has the church said about a certain topic over the years? But if anything or at any time what the church has said is in conflict with our best interpretation of scripture, then we're going to say tradition is wrong. So tradition does not uh, supersede scripture. Scripture comes first. Same thing with reason. So we have intellect. God gave us minds and ability to critically think. It's a wonderful thing, and we can bring that to our ethical discussions. But again, if there's anything that we derive from our ability to reason that conflicts with our best, best attempt to understand scripture, then we're going to go with scripture. Where there's conflict, scripture comes first. And the same is true for experience. So experience is, you know, the spiritual, the movement of the Holy Spirit. And this is something that's very much prized in our day and time. Uh, a lot of people go to worship and they'll say, 
a, a worship service is good if they feel moved by the spirit. Uh, we're very into experience and to what I think and feel and believe. But again, as followers of Jesus, we have to take our experience and measure it against the word of God. And if there's conflict, the word of God comes first. Uh, in, it's interesting in church history that at different periods of times, different legs of the stool have tried to supersede the seat of the stool, which is scripture. So in the time of the Reformation, the question was, how does church tradition relate with scripture? Uh, it used to be that you know church tradition sometimes could be more important than scripture, and that was wrong. In the Age of Enlightenment, it was how does reason relate with scripture? Um, scientific achievement and advancement became preeminent, and people tried to make that the seat instead of scripture. And in our times, as I said, it's often experience. Uh, you know, people say, I had my own interaction with God, I have my own feelings, and they will try to put that over scripture. But again, experience is a leg that supports scripture where it conflicts then we're going to go with scripture. Let's talk about the Old Testament and the New Testament as well, because I've entitled this series Ethics in the New Testament. Uh, when we speak of ethical concerns, we typically are looking at the New Testament, but doing so doesn't mean we're throwing the Old Testament out completely. The New Testament is absolutely based upon the writings and teachings of the Old Testament. So much of it is folded into what we talk about in the New Testament. For an example, um, New Testament teachings on sexual morality regularly draw upon the Old Testament's explicit condemnations of certain activities and relationships. Likewise, in the New Testament, uh, we're encouraged to care for the poor. Guess what? They were encouraged to care for the poor in the Old Testament as well. So there's a, a, the New Testament is definitely built upon the Old Testament. Some morals and ethics are not explicitly addressed in the Gospels. So people, you might hear the argument, well, Jesus never talked about that topic. Yes, that's true, because his ministry was aimed at the Jewish people, and they would have followed the Mosaic law of the Old Testament. So there were some things that Jesus didn't even need to talk about because it was already understood as being, uh, you know, in conflict with the will of God. When the New Testament goes beyond the Old Testament, when it reveals something new to us, this is often explicitly stated. For instance, this happens in the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus is talking about some of the Old Testament laws and actually kind of tightening up on them. He'll say things like, thou shall not murder, but oh, by the way, if you're angry and you call someone a name or you um, defame someone, you're in a sense murdering that person. So he's got, he kind of takes it to a whole new level. But that's typically called out for us when that happens. Uh, Jesus' death, resurrection, and enthronement are absolutely the central action of God for the salvation and redemption of humanity. It's the central action of scripture. And so therefore, the New Testament does have special privilege when it comes to ethical decisions. It's the lens through which we look back on the Old Testament. So we are going to privilege what we find in the New Testament, but recognizing that so much of what we find in the New Testament has a basis in the Old Testament. Uh, so there's modes of ethical discourse in the Bible. So in his book, Richard Hayes identified four different kind of ways that um, ethics are talked about. The first one, probably the easiest one to recognize, are just out-and-out -out rules, either direct commandments or pro prohibitions of specific behaviors. The best example, the Ten Commandments. For example, thou shall not kill, or depending on your translation, thou shall not murder. This is Exodus 20, 13. That's just a direct statement. Black and white, thou, thou shall not murder. Of course, what we know from the New Testament is Jesus expands the definition of what that means. But anyway, that's a rule. Then we have something called principles. Hayes identifies these as sort of more general frameworks of moral consideration. So his example is the discussion of uh, from Mark 12, where Jesus is saying the most important thing is to love God and love people. Uh, that's 
not, you know, black and white because there's not that commandment language. He's not saying thou shall love God and love people. He's talking in general about the most important commandment. The most important thing we can do is to love God and love people and everything else flows from that. So that's a principle. Then Hayes identifies paradigms. These are stories or accounts of people who model exemplary conduct or sometimes reprehensible conduct. So an example of this comes from Luke chapter 10, the story of the Good Samaritan. It's a parable that Jesus tells, and it teaches us, um, you know, an ethical course of action. What's the right thing to do? What's the wrong thing to do? And then finally, uh, his last category is something he calls symbolic world. So this is like a category through which we interpret reality. So for instance, the category of human sinfulness, um, the category of God's grace, like kind of, it's it's somewhat close to the concept of principles. So his example for us there is um, Romans 1, where Paul talks about human sinfulness. So these are just frameworks to kind of help us. It's nice to make a distinction. Hey, this is, you know, this is a commandment. It's just, it's pretty literal black and white. This is a parable, so we're going to, it's, it's just a big giant metaphor <laughs> guiding us to a certain course of action. This is symbolic, or this is a principle. There's no hierarchy of importance in these categories. They're just different ways of dealing with ethical dilemmas. A parable contains just as much truth as one of the Ten Commandments. It just helps us as we're thinking it through. So in the process of discernment, First, we have to recognize there is no single overarching answer to address all ethical concerns. <laughs> it is a very nuanced discussion. Things have to be wrestled with on a case-by-case -case basis and sometimes on a community-by-community -community basis. Any ethic that intends to be biblical must understand that not all ethical concerns have equal weight. We have to determine peripheral issues versus those things that really are central to the New Testament witness. So for instance, the issue from New Testament of eating idol meat, that was something peripheral. That was something to wrestle with on a community by community basis within your small group of people. You know, are we going to eat idol meat or are we not? Either one would be fine. But there are certain things that are much more central, such as thou shall not murder. Uh, that's a pretty central one. Understanding what murder means, of course, there's some nuance there, but it, it is, it's a much weightier thing than what you are eating on a day-to-day -day basis. So as we go through our specific issues, uh, we're going to follow Richard Hayes' model. So we're going to pray. So please pray before you uh, listen to the podcast and definitely before Sunday when we have meet for discussion. We're going to identify biblical texts and their modes relating to the issue. Some issues are going to not have very much of anything. Some issues will have a lot of biblical uh, evidence that we can look at. Then we're going to analyze the issue in light of the legs of the stool, so tradition, reason, and experience, and how does that help us wrestle with these thoughts. And then finally, we're going to talk about our conclusions and implications discussed together in the community of faith. This is why I'm encouraging you to email me with your questions and comments, uh, because, you know, right now it's one-sided. <laughs> I'm providing you with these episodes, but I do want your input. If you do have specific questions, I'll try to work that in. And certainly you are welcome to attend our discussion group via Zoom on Sunday. So some categories, this is not a comprehensive list, but some categories of ethics, human relationships and identity, falling under that, identity itself, issues of race, ethnicity, and gender, uh, marriage and divorce, and human sexuality. Another big category, medical ethics. Falling under that, we have things like abortion, medical interventions, mental health. Uh, another category, economics and politics. <laughs> Yay. Uh, falling under that is money, economic models, and of course, political parties. And then another category is justice and falling under justice violence and or war is war ever just is it necessary how as believers should we feel about such things 
Again, not a comprehensive list. I probably won't be able to talk about every single one of these things, but I'm going to do my best to address the biggest ones. So here is a real-time uh, podcast release for you. So on Wednesday, April 24th, 2024, I will uh, release an episode on ethics and identity, issues of identity. So race, ethnicity, uh, gender, all of that. It's a, it's a big, big issue in our current society. Uh, then on Thursday, April 25th, I will release an episode on ethics and human relationships. So this is marriage, divorce, human sexuality. Uh, then Friday, April 26th, an episode on ethics and issues of economics and justice. And then finally, on Saturday, April 27th, ethics and mental and physical health. If there, again, are specific things you would like to address or you have an example you want to give, I will keep your name anonymous, but I would love specifics because I can certainly work that in. My email is Kimberly at KimberlyConstantMinistries.com. Uh, if you're listening to this, if you go on YouTube, you can see, actually watch it. And there's a PDF that I use and you'll see my email address on there. You can also comment on YouTube and I will see those comments and I can work that in if you have a question. And the comments come to me first before I have to approve them to be shown. So if you do have a question and you want to keep it anonymous, you can just say, don't, don't show this, but here's my question for you. And I will try to work it in. All right, so opening this can of worms, it is not going to be easy, but we're going to do our best, and I will do my best. Uh, just for those of you who don't know me, I am a United Methodist pastor. I'm ordained. I'm on leave of absence right now uh, from the Texas Conference of the United Methodist Church because my family and I moved to Florida during the pandemic, and I have four kids. They're all college and high school age and I've just been spending time with them and working on this online ministry that I'm developing and really finding uh, God calling me into this space. So I'm, I'm here for now and happy to be here. And, but my background is uh, a Methodist theology and you'll hear that come through, I'm sure. Uh, and I genuinely, genuinely want to approach this issue with such humility and such love <laughs> and uh and just you know i know some of these discussions just even having the discussion can be very hurtful for people so if there's a certain subject matter that that is true for you if something's just a little too close for you uh maybe skip that episode and listen to the next one sometimes you're not in a safe place to have these discussions and that's okay uh, and just know, again, if you disagree with me, it is okay. I welcome that. Please, let's have a conversation. But let's just make sure we're respectful and kind and loving towards one another. All right, friends, I would like to end this episode with prayer. And then I will be back Wednesday with the release of the first episode on ethics and identity. So please pray with me. Gracious God, thank you so much for the gift of the Bible of, of Jesus Christ and the revelations that you've given us that help us to know you better. God, give us grace and humility and compassion, cultivate a sense of unity and love for one another as we grapple with these difficult questions. God, may we know that we are all hopefully just doing our best and trying our best to follow the feet of Jesus. Um, Lord, thank you that even when we fail, even when we're imperfect, even when our dustiness shows through, God, you are the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And you tell us that we are loved unconditionally, that every single one of us has been extended grace and mercy in Jesus Christ, and that you are for us. We are not alone. And if we are believers, we have the power of the Holy Spirit within us to help us in our spiritual journey. So God, may we enter into this week with humbleness and grace. And thank you, Lord, for this awesome community. In Jesus' name I pray, amen and amen. All right, everyone, I will see you back uh, Wednesday for our discussion on identity. And again, send me your questions. Thanks so much. Good night.